Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you back and I would like to say a big thank you. Thank you to all of you for being so timely and making it possible that we start kind of within um, the designated time schedule that we have here. So as I said, we do have uh, further highlights prepared for you this afternoon and this next session is certainly going to be one of them. Uh, the next session, we're, we've, taken a, we've taken a look outside and um, have hopped around the globe in the first panel session that we had. We had speakers from India, from Kenya, so we really had a global perspective and now we'd like to take that perspective back to Germany and ask the question, whatever happened in Germany? And uh, it's just up to me now to introduce the moderator of this upcoming session. session. I would like to introduce to you Ben Wagner, who is an absolute expert in the topics that we're discussing here today. And as of uh, last week, he's also Dr. Ben Wagner and is now a <laughs> yes, postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Global Communication Studies in the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Ben. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see the room so full on a topic like this. Um, if the panelists could please take their seats, if you could, um, please. Um, I think Herr Ströbele would be best on the right. We have three excellent panelists here. Sadly, Mr. Markus Löning couldn't make it. Uh, he's sick today, and so instead we managed to convince Wenzel Michalski, the director of Human Rights Watch, to make it here. Wenzel Michalski is one of the main people at Human Rights Watch working on the internet and human rights and is also a, an expert on these issues. Then directly to my right we have Judith Horkart who works with Spiegel Online and is also very closely involved in some of these issues. And then on the far right we have Hans-Christian Ströbele, a member still and since he joined the German Parliament of the Parliamentary Control Institution within the German Parliament for the Intelligence Services. So in that sense, he's also a, an expert in many different ways on understanding how intelligence services can be controlled and regulated. But I'd just like to start with uh, Judith here on the left, because I think we have an extraordinarily interesting panel, and we've seen over the last few months the extent to which journalists are working very closely together with activists, with different members of civil society. How has that been in your role, and how do you think the role of journalism is changing in this debate? This one, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Um, <clears throat> I am wondering how much it's going to change or is it changing? I think sometimes, some things uh, definitely have changed and others haven't. We have always worked together with uh, sources and informants and we always had to protect them. This is nothing new. And um, that activists are sources is also nothing new. This has always been the case. But, um, of course, in uh, technology issues, we have to, a lot of journalists have to learn a lot themselves, like uh, how, to, how to protect their sources, how to um, encrypt their emails, for example, encrypt data, how to handle data they get or something. Um, but the good thing is, uh, this gives us good foundation to explain it to everyone, because this year is a very educated crowd, probably, and everybody knows already for years and years what was going on, but my mother, for example, doesn't. And, um, and for her, this is all new about uh, hearing something about encryption or uh, intelligence services. And um, so uh, it's very important to explain things, what is, what is, uh, um, sorry, uh, what is um, possible when you, when you have a smartphone that you're carrying computers around, that there's a microphone, whatever, how, how does surveillance work? And we did a lot of that uh, during this year. And I think it's not only publishing, it's also editing, for example, data editing uh, information and uh, a lot of explaining. Why is it? Because we have a lot of readers who say, who cares? If they are finding terrorists, uh, let's do it. They can read all my emails, they can listen to all my phone calls, and so for us it's important to um, make clear where the problem is, kind of, and, um, uh, and explain how uh, people can protect themselves. Sounds good, but it also sounds like a relatively challenging job to be involved in. Do you think you're able to protect your sources in all situations? Is that challenging? <laughs> yeah, challenging. <laughs> it's uh, really, it is a challenging time, and uh, we are really honest with that. Before uh, the Snowden links, I uh, was able to encrypt my private emails, for example, but I'm also I'm, I'm spending a lot of my free time with activists and people who are always talking about uh, uh, signals intelligence and but to be really honest sometimes I thought yeah 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 everybody's listening to listening to my phone call 
somebody is he's leaving uh, some he's saying <laughs> he's just turning off his mobile phone which i think is a very ah, good point, good at idea, this point yeah. of <laughs> um so what was he i guess but i to be honest i always thought yeah yeah freaks uh, of course, <laughs> everybody's listening to my phone calls, everybody's reading all the emails, and now, um, you know, oh, they were right, and I had to uh, admit that they are right, and uh, that there's a lot to do, and uh, we're doing the best to protect our sources, as always, and we, we published a little um, guideline on our website of Spiegel Online for also so people who want to talk to their Spiegel, the magazine, which is uh, something different. and. Um, uh, how to how to encrypt their files, how to send an encrypted email, but still it's always pretty soon, you know what, uh, give us a call from somewhere from phone booth or just meet us in person. And so, um, because they are still, we don't want to um, pretend protection when if we can't protect. But happily we have somebody on this panel who can help, to help respond to that. So we're hearing that journalists are concerned about the situation that they're in and their phones might be listening to. Is that as a member of the German parliament and sort of responsible for regulating the intelligence services? Should journalists be concerned about that in Germany? Also ich muss mich zunächst uh, entschuldigen. Mein Englisch ist nicht so gut. Deshalb habe ich hier eine freundliche Dolmetscherin, die übersetzt das dann für das Auditorium. Aber ich fange mal an mit Deutsch. Mr. Schurich says he's very sorry that um, his command of English does not permit him to reply in English, but um, I will help out a little bit, being a non-professional translator here, to translate what he's saying in German into English for you. Deshalb konnte ich mich auch mit Edward Snowden nicht so besonders gut unterhalten, sondern musste zwei Journalisten mitnehmen, die dann übersetzt haben. It's also the reason why he had to take two journalists along on his trip when he met Edward Snowden, because there was a bit of a communication barrier there. Ähm, was jetzt die Frage anbetrifft, äh, ich bin seit 1999 Mitglied des Parlamentarischen Kontrollgremiums für die Nachrichtendienste und äh, wir haben natürlich immer wieder mal gefragt, nach dem, was die Bundesregierung und was äh, die deutschen Geheimdienste wissen über die Tätigkeit äh, der US-Dienste in Deutschland. Uns wurde immer gesagt, das wissen wir nicht, um die kümmern wir uns nicht, wir spionieren Freunde nicht aus. So, Mr. Schur has been a member of the German Parliamentary Control uh, Gremium. Do you have, a, you have the professional translation for this, right? Since 1999. So, this is the entity in the German Parliament that um, is um, the control gremium for the secret service here in Germany, has been asking precisely these questions since he's been a member of this gremium and has always give, been given the answer that the question is not relevant because spy, we don't spy on our friends. Allies don't spy on allies. Wir wussten, dass die deutschen Dienste mit den US-Geheimdiensten, also mit der NSA und der CIA, viele Informationen austauscht, dass eine sehr enge Zusammenarbeit war. Und man hat sich geradezu gerühmt, dass die Zusammenarbeit so gut ist. Aber uns wurde immer wieder gesagt, wenn wir an das Thema kamen, haben euch das amerikanische Dienste oder US-amerikanische Dienste erzählt, äh, da war dann immer Schluss mit der Information. So, it was always apparent that there was collabor is collaboration between secret services, between the US secret service and the German secret service. And people were even proud to say, you know, how good this collaboration is and how happy we are to be close allies and buddies and able to exchange information. But every time that, that, was, um, that people tried to get more precise on what kind of information is actually being exchanged, there was kind of a cut off in the conversation. Deshalb muss man sagen, uh, zu Beginn, dieses, dieser Veröffentlichung des Skandals im Juni äh, wussten wir nichts äh, über äh, konkrete Ausspähmaßnahmen äh, der NSA in Deutschland oder der CIA in Deutschland, äh, sondern äh, wir waren äh, genauso überrascht äh, wie die ganze deutsche Bevölkerung und zutiefst erschrocken. Äh, und wir haben uns dann über den Sommer während der Ferienzeit bemüht, Informationen zu bekommen, aber wir wissen heute auch nicht mehr, als im Spiegel oder in der Zeitung steht. 
So when the first revelations were made by Snowden back in June, this was the first time that members of this parliamentary control gremium also found out about NSA mass surveillance in Germany and the actual activities between the German Secret Service and US Secret Service. And it came just as much as a surprise to them as to anybody who has not been uh, working on these issues uh, in depth previously. Can I just ask a question there though, because it's interesting to me. How does it feel to be in a room full of people, some of whom may be better informed than somebody like you who is responsible for regulating and stopping the abuses of power of German intelligence services? Uh, wir können uh, die Dienste nicht vollständig kontrollieren. Das war immer klar nach dem Gesetz ist unser Partner die Bundesregierung und sind nicht die Dienste unser Partner. Das heißt, wir sind darauf angewiesen, das zu erfahren und zu wissen, was die Bundesregierung uns sagt und nicht, was tatsächlich in den Diensten vorgeht. Wir können nur auf Beschluss der Mehrheit des Gremiums, das immer eine Regierungsmehrheit ist, beschließen, dass wir uns bestimmte Bereiche der Nachrichtendienste zur Untersuchung vornehmen. So, secret services are not fully controllable and there is no direct insight from this parliamentary control gremium into the activities of the BND. The contact people are not contact people from BND directly, but government representatives. So it's always the uh, members of parliament in this gremium going via members of the government that are in charge of uh, oversight of the secret service and contacting them for specific questions on insight into specific activities of the BND, but never a full oversight of their activities. Das heißt ganz konkret, die großen Skandale, auch der Vergangenheit, beispielsweise, dass der Bundesnachrichtendienst und das Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz, also der Inlands- und der Auslandsgeheimdienst, in Guantanamo waren und dort den Gefangenen Kornatz befragt haben. Oder dass die in ein Foltergefängnis in Syrien einen deutschen Staatsangehörigen Samar als der ähm, befragt haben. Das haben wir alles aus dem Spiegel erfahren und erst nachdem das in der Zeitung stand, konnten wir uns damit beschäftigen. So there are a number of activities that um, this gremium, Mr. Schrobel, only found out uh, through um, the press, like the Spiegel, for instance. Uh, an example was activities of uh, the BND uh, and our inner state um, um, news service. Um, sorry? Thanks. <laughs> that one. Um, um, being active in Guantanamo, for instance, was something that he found out via the Spiegel and not um, via the official channels. But then it's interesting. I'd like to ask also to, to Wenzel Michalski, who's here from Human Rights Watch. It sounds like there's two uh, responses we could take from this. The one is that there's a huge problem with the existing laws regulating intelligence and intelligence control and that some changes would need to be there. The other would be to accept the fact that the laws are awful, intelligence services can't be controlled, and it's the responsibility of NGOs, activists, and journalists to bring more light into the matter because parliamentarians don't have the information. Yeah, that's right. Um, what Mr. Schröbele just said is, is very sad, and, um, but it is the, rea the reality. Um, our representatives, members of parliament, failed to control the government, and they keep failing it. Um, the laws actually support this failure and the weakness. Um, so the role of the press and NGO civil society is more important than ever. And sadly, now we will have the grand coalition, very much likely. Uh, that means the opposition is absolutely dwarfed. There will no control whatsoever. That means that, that civil society has much more of a huge responsibility and so does the press. And I talked to a couple of journalists recently um, and thanks God they really take this on board. And we hope that civil society and, and, and the media will be able to push much more to actually yeah, uncovering the truth and what it's all about. And um, when I hear from Ströbele that they were only informed by Spiegel and other media, uh, it's, it's shocking actually, you know, and uh, I think we need uh, like a coalition between NGOs and the media to push for more control mechanisms and more responsibility and awareness of the MPs. It's not only the laws, 
It's also the laziness and the moral weakness of MPs who are only looking at their own careers and um, maybe the low-hanging fruit. Uh, they like to pick on topics which are popular and internet and surveillance wasn't that popular before NSA scandal and before Snowden. So even if they knew about it, they wouldn't touch it because it, it's not great. And there are only a few MPs who dare to concentrate, to focus on stuff that's not popular. One was Viola von Kramon. She was great in uncovering human rights abuses in Central Asia, a place where nobody looked at. I'm going away a little bit from the internet, but just as an example, she's not in parliament anymore. You know, we really, uh, we, we miss those guys and those people. They, they're not there and um, the Grand Coalition is a, it's, it's really, it's, it's a bad story. And I think um, I must blame the Greens that they chickened out of the responsibility. We would have needed them and they prefer to do some more years of navel gazing and maybe sweet talk and try to um, pretend to be upset in parliament because now they can do it without any responsibility. I think it's shameful that they didn't take the responsibility and um, leave it up to us to, to do all this. We don't have an ally in the SPD. I talked to Gabriel a couple of months ago and he was bashing civil society. He said they should all come and become members uh, of the SPD and <laughs> <laughs> civil society is something for rich people and bourgeois people and I ask him, yeah, so uh, why don't you have more members? Why are you an aging party? And he said, yeah, I know, it's terrible. And I mean, we have people, you know, they want to work for us. We Interns are queuing up and they have great degrees from fantastic universities like Princeton, Harvard and, and Oxford and Cambridge and so on and so forth to work for just a little bit of money, you know, just to that they're able to survive, but they feel the need and the parties don't have these people anymore. And why is it? Because they're lazy. <laughs> Would you like to respond to that? I wasn't sure whether you'd, but I mean, please. I don't. Um, Ich kann, ich, kann, ich kann ihm aber recht geben, äh, äh, man muss wirklich sagen, ohne die vierte Gewalt, nennt man das ja in Deutschland, also die Presse, ohne die vierte Gewalt, insbesondere ohne investigative Journalisten und ohne Whistleblower, sind die Parlamentarier und die parlamentarischen Gremien in Deutschland, aber auch in den USA, zahnlose Tiger. Ähm, dann, wir können nur dann zubeißen, äh, wenn wir Informationen bekommen, dann können wir, und so geschieht das auch jetzt wieder im Deutschen Bundestag, einen Untersuchungsausschuss verlangen. Und die, in dem Untersuchungsausschuss können wir wie ein Gericht Zeugen vorladen und können Sachverhalte klären. Und das ist auch mehr oder weniger erfolgreich. So, Mr. Schröber totally agrees to the extent of saying that um, it's true, like in Germany, without the fourth power, without in particular investigative journalism, without whistleblowers, without civil society, uh, parliamentarians have, have no power, have no possibility to move forward on these issues themselves. It's only through this outer influence into parliament that they're able to um, to really question the government and uh, create entities within the parliament that will look at these issues more closely and, and work on them. It's great because it was very helpful when I, when I invited different people to be on this panel, I thought that we'd have the Parliamentary Control Commission on this side of the table. It seems like it's actually on the other side of the table and everybody in this room <laughs> is responsible for it. But there's also, it creates some challenges for journalists, I would imagine, because you're on the one hand affected by this debate and you're sort of seen in a very important role, especially investigative journalists. But it's also, uh, how, do you, how do you retain your independence in that debate? Yeah, that's really, um, when you said a coalition between activists and journalists, this is always, uh, it sounds a little bit problematic because uh, of course we are also, we have an informant and we, we have an opinion, but this doesn't mean that just because we get information um, that we can be ruled by some activists and saying how to publish this information or how much to publish because I already said that we are editing always because we don't, and I also don't publish every story I know, of course not. And I think there are things um, which are secret and uh, should remain secret. And I know that there are 
might be probably plenty of other opinions in this room, but uh, for me as a journalist, um, it's important that, um, that uh, we make the decision what to publish, how to publish it, how to tell the story and tell the people uh, what uh, the uh, activist wants, that it's, uh, they have their own agenda and, uh, and everybody else has. And so um, it's um, very important, not just for information to become um, uh, one of the th thinking, oh yeah, those are the good guys, let's go there. They have the information and they don't. And so uh, we are always trying to be in between and not take one side, except for our opinion. But for me, also as a citizen, I, I mean, it's great that you hear everything from uh, Der Spiegel and read it in the newspaper, but of course, for me, the news is not that terrorists are being surveyed or people who, are, who might be terrorists um, and their phones and emails are being monitored. The news is that obviously pretty much everyone else is too. And I wish I heard that not from some informant, from some brave guy, from somebody, and not from the media. I wish I have heard that from the government way earlier because I think, okay, yeah, we have a secret service too. So uh, I think, okay, I should be informed as a citizen, not by just somebody who needs to hide, but by the people who are responsible for it. Would you like to respond to that? Journalisten äh, sind so wichtig, äh, dass Journalisten mindestens genauso geschützt werden müssen vor staatlicher Verfolgung äh, im Zusammenhang mit ihrer beruflichen Tätigkeit äh, wie Abgeordnete. Deshalb äh, ist es von immenser Bedeutung, äh, dass Journalisten einmal ein Zeugnisverweigerungsrecht haben, äh, also nichts aussagen müssen, über ihre Informanten, äh, sonst bekommen sie keine Informationen mehr. Und deshalb ist es so ein fürchterlicher Schlag gegen einen freien Journalismus, äh, wenn beispielsweise der Mitarbeiter von Herrn Greenworth äh, in London auf dem Flughafen gezwungen worden ist, da gibt es ein extra englisches Gesetz dafür, gezwungen worden ist, äh, auszusagen, auch über seine Quellen, auch über Passworte und auch über ganz vertraue ihm, äh, ganz äh, anvertraute äh, Geschichten. Ähm, das ist in der Dimension, ähm, was das dem Schutz der, äh, oder dem, Bürger, dem Schutz der Bürgerrechte schadet, gar nicht hoch genug einzuschätzen. In Deutschland hoffe ich, dass sowas bis, äh, nicht möglich äh, wäre. So Mr. Schur responded by saying that in our democratic system, in his point of view, journalists are as important as parliamentarians and the, their, the protection of their freedoms, in particular the right to um, keep their witnesses disclosed and not share information about who their informants are is fundamental to an existing democratic system, which is why like the downfall of press freedom within Europe, um, exemplified by the UK <coughs> government when they detained then Greenwald's partner, um, is, 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 a, is a terrible state that we're in right now and, and a whole new dimension that we're facing as a general threat to democracy. Vielleicht darf ich noch hinzufügen, ähm, Sarah Harrison, ähm, eine Mitarbeiterin äh, von, Whistle, äh, von äh, Whistleblower, kann man auch sagen, von Wikileaks, äh, ist ja jetzt hier in Deutschland und es ist äh, eine Schande für Europa, nicht nur für England, äh, sondern auch für Europa, dass diese Frau, nur weil sie viel weiß, sich derzeit nicht nach England begeben kann, sondern Angst haben muss, dass sie in England auch solchen Pressionen unterworfen wird, ins Gefängnis gesteckt wird und dazu gezwungen wird, ihre Geheimnisse preiszugeben, beispielsweise auch die über den Aufenthaltsort von Snowden. So, um, he added, Mr. Scherbler added that it is an absolute disgrace to Europe that people like Sarah Harrison from WikiLeaks currently feels like she has to reside in Germany and cannot return to the UK for fear of facing charges there and having to disclose information, for instance, about the whereabouts of Edward Snowden. 
I just wanted to add um, that I'm also really concerned when I hear about the news that, for example, uh, the Guardian editor-in-chief is being questioned and um, that uh, media, not only government, but also other media are taking media for uh, revelations or for publishing any revelations and saying you're helping terrorists, you're supporting that it's uh, our country is insecure because of you. And so this is one of the many tasks of journalists right now, too, to stand together uh, with the journalists of other countries, of other medias, um, and uh, other newspapers or TV stations. Um, after The Guardian, I think one day, I have to think about it, when somebody, a member of the parliament said that they were helping terrorists, and afterwards The Guardian asked all the editors in chief of Le Monde, of Der Spiegel, of all uh, the newspapers around, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, for example, um, and they all published a letter on the Guardian website um, to support them. And I think this is really important, even if I know that I know that a lot of people hate journalists and think they are doing everything wrong. But I also think this is a very important task for all of us to fight for uh, the freedom, because right now we can work here pretty well. There are sometimes somebody's ending a debate, but uh, this is it. Nobody's questioned. <laughs> And so at least it's a, an opportunity to continue that debate, even if it's not wanted by the powers that be. Um, Wenzel, you have a very interesting position being both a former journalist and a current employee of, um, of a human rights organization. Uh, how do you feel the sort of, you were talking before and the sort of about an alliance between the journalists and NGOs, and it sounds like at least on sort of the fighting together for press freedoms, this is one very key area where things need to be developed together. Yeah, that's right. Um, we depend very much on the media because um, our researchers, they go out in the field where massive human rights abuses are happening and they're documenting these um, abuses and then we, you know, we inform the press and the press hopefully reports about um, our research. Um, but unfortunately, increasingly, we cannot find that many great partners in the media anymore. Um, because the media is cutting costs. So, um, for example, our Asia division had a retreat the other day um, where they thought, uh, where we were thinking about how will they work with the press when they don't have these old guys, these, these old foreign correspondents anymore who were very knowledgeable about a certain area. And now they have to deal with freelancers and stringers, young people who have no clue, and they have to start from scratch explaining everything to them what happened. So instead of just ringing the guy from the New York Times and, hey, we're we doing this and that, and, and he understands immediately and uh, gets the point, or she, um, they, yeah, they confronted with people who have no clue. And so the media also has a responsibility beyond of profit making, really to take on the role as the fourth power um, in society, not only in Germany, but also, of course, in, in Britain and in, in the States and, and other countries, to take the role more seriously. We need the media, and civil society needs the media as a loudspeaker to, and as, uh, as an informant. It's interesting because at the same time we've been talking about the UK and Germany and different perspectives in different countries and of course what happened at the, at the airport in Heathrow I believe is terrible. At the same time at a European level, Germany and the UK are working together to slow down European data protection laws and to, to, to make things even more difficult and to give us less privacy, although they still complain loudly that things are going wrong. Does Human Rights Watch have any information about that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we, we see that, you know, this, it's, it's happening right now. I think um, we all know that um, whereas the German government pretends to complain about surveillance and Merkel phone gate and whatever, uh, Merkel phone, uh, Merkel <laughs> is in Brussels the next day and cozies up with Cameron and um, trying to uh, prevent any meaningful privacy laws. And instead of... Um, criticizing surveillance, she says she wants to be part of, or Germany should be part of the Five Eyes. And that is really shameful. And it is actually absolutely irresponsible. Given our history, given our past with the Stasi and the Gestapo, we should know better. And we're failing history if we don't take on leadership on this issue. And we don't, you know? I mean, yeah, we are partnering up with Brazil and um, have this watered-down UN resolution 
let it happen that it's, will, that it's being watered down because everybody wants to agree with us, each other. And it wasn't Germany who took on the leadership, it was Brazil. And that's fine, that's great, but it's actually embarrassing for Germany. When I actually, you know, I, I mean, um, we had a round table discussion at the foreign uh, ministry the other day, and they were very proudly presenting the UN resolution draft or announcing it. But on the same time, those people who were working on it, um, one guy of them asked us a question, he said, you are human rights organizations here at the round table. You protect the rights of humans. So why do you want to protect data? So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is, you know, it's hashtag facepalm. I mean, this is so <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I love the fact that you also mentioned it as the foreign monastery before you said foreign ministry. It seemed like a sort of a selection of occult priests who travel around the world speaking about things that they don't really understand. Yeah, the guy in charge of um, cyber, cyber security, internet freedom, he's a security expert. No, nothing wrong with that, but is that the right person to lead Germany towards more internet freedom? Uh, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve, I say. Do you want to jump in? I sometimes wonder if uh, Germany wants <laughs> to have the leadership, especially the people, because I feel that it's only a pretty small group very interested in this topic. All of them are here. <laughs> a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> but uh, it's really a small group. I see it. I wrote a lot of articles from June on, and a lot of articles um, have hardly been read at all. A lot of articles, of course, reach a lot of people and everything. But um, and now the last one, when it was about uh, the last revelation about the telephones and the spying on monitoring of telephones, um, then we received a reader mail and he said, "Just stop it, please stop it now. <laughs> we can't hear it anymore. We don't want to hear anything about it anymore." And a lot of people, it's not only bashing of politicians saying, "Hello, what are you doing? Why aren't you helping?" It's also the people. I have, I have the feeling that uh, they are not really, the vast majority is not really interested, doesn't really care, doesn't want to change their habits, that don't want to learn something about it, and surveillance is something, they just don't want to hear about it. This is just my feeling, so maybe I just wanted to make clear that it's not that um, every German wants to do a C demonstration on the street, they are very tiny, there have been some, but right now there's not, uh, you know, not everybody standing in front of the uh, Reichstags building. First, uh ich bin ja nicht nur Abgeordneter, sondern auch Rechtsanwalt. Not just also Mr. auch rechtskundig. Mr. Schröber ist nicht nur ein Parlamentarier, sondern er ist auch ein Lawyer. Also hat er auch ein legales Wissen in diesem Feld. Und deshalb kann ich nur zu der Argumentation, die Sie gerade vorgetragen haben von der Bundesregierung, sagen, die Bundesregierung hat offenbar immer noch nicht verstanden, dass das Recht auf informationelle Selbstbestimmung, das Recht auf Privatheit, das Recht auf Datenschutz, Grundrechte in Deutschland verfassungsrechtlich gesichert und Menschenrechte sind in Europa und in der Welt, wie man jetzt an der Resolution sehen konnte. Es gehört zu den international anerkannten Menschenrechte und zu den europäischen Grundrechten, so, um, sadly, the German government has not understood that the right to privacy, the right to informational freedom, um, the right to data protection, that those are basic constitutional rights in Germany and beyond that, basic human rights. Und deshalb haben wir jetzt die Grünen, die Bundesregierung aufgefordert, weil Großbritannien ja ein Mitglied der EU ist, ein Vertragsverletzungsverfahren gegen die britische Regierung in Europa anzustrengen, weil die britische Regierung mit ihrem Geheimdienst, aber auch mit ihrem Gesetz, das zu Aussagen, die Aus, das Journalisten zu Aussagen verpflichtet, ganz eindeutig europäisches Menschenrecht verletzt. Und wenn die Europäische Union noch was wert ist, dann muss man gegen einzelne Verstöße von Vertragspartnern auch was machen können und muss auch was tun.
So as the UK is, of course, a member state of the EU, the Green Party has now filed a complaint, uh, has asked the German government, rather, to file a complaint at the EU level against the UK as they are breaching EU contracts and constitutions with their actions, with GCH GCHQ's actions, but also the anti-terror laws that they have, which force journalists to disclose information and hope that consequences will be drawn out of this because this is a breach of... Uh, EU right and it cannot be stood for that a member does this without any reactions against it. Thank you. I just... Also, ich sage, der Mensch, wir alle, wir Menschen, sind keine vollständigen Menschen mit unseren Menschenrechten, wenn wir nicht frei kommunizieren können solange es nicht einen konkreten Tatverdacht gibt, dass wir an irgendwelchen strafbaren Handlungen beteiligt sind. Das ist eines der zentralen und wichtigsten Grundrechte, gerade jetzt in der modernen Gesellschaft. In our, this modern society that we live in, it's just that we as people are not uh, complete without that human right of free communication. I think that's a very valuable point, but to follow up on that, um, it's interesting as a, a British-German citizen of both countries to hear that uh, the, the German parliamentarians are thinking that Germany should sh sue the UK. That will cause people all sorts of identity problems. Um, <laughs> Same, at least one. Oh, on both sides of the table then, clearly. But what would interest me is specifically as a parliamentarian and a lawyer, if Germany were to be successful in joining the five eyes, and then it would become six eyes or seven eyes or eight eyes or whatever, what consequences do you think that would have for existing German laws, but also for existing German surveillance practices? Also, erstens wollen die Five Eyes, also die fünf Länder, kein Six Eye. Die wollen kein zusätzliches äh, Ohr haben und kein Auge. Ähm, aber, äh, aber darüber hinaus wäre es auch gar nicht gut für Deutschland, wenn es in den Kreis der Five Eyes aufgenommen würde, weil damit würde Deutschland eine in Teilen vorbildliche Datenschutzregelung aufgeben. Wir haben in Deutschland für Deutsche, also für deutsche Staatsbürger und vor allen Dingen auch für die deutschen Geheimdienste Datenschutzregelungen, die weit über das hinausgehen, was dann noch erhalten bliebe für Deutschland. Deshalb ist es ein Fehler, überhaupt anzustreben, ein sechstes Ohr oder Auge zu werden. So, um, firstly, there are two parts to this answer. The first part is that um, Mr. Schroeder believes that uh, five eyes don't want any new members on their gang, so no more eyes and no more ears in that team welcome. And secondly, it wouldn't be good for Germany to want to join that group because it, we would then forfeit what we can still consider rather strong data protection laws that we have in place that should be leading by example and not taken back. Die, die, die Five Eyes Regelungen sind Regelungen nicht äh, um die Überwachung einzudämmen, sondern sind Regelungen um Überwachung gemeinsam auszudehnen, leichter zu machen. Of course, Five Eyes is uh, nothing that will um, st stop or prohibit or um, slow down surveillance in any way, but of course are a system um, that enables uh, borderless surveillance th within this allied community. Wenzel, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah I think um, you're rightly proud of the, our data protection laws, but you can say bye-bye to them now because um, the Green Party failed to be a member of the the government. Um, with the SPD, um, the CDU will happily get rid of the data protection laws we have now, and uh, they want to get it online in line with the EU laws, which are much weaker, and they announced it already. And if you look at the coalition draft coalition treaty, and um, it's, it's terrible what you read about um, internet and freedom, because it's not there. It, it just doesn't exist. Um, the, it's much more about security. The word human rights is mentioned many times, but uh, without any content. It's just um, um, Sonntagsrede, soapbox um, oratory. Yeah? Um, and um, I think uh, we will face some much tougher times also when it comes to surveillance. It was the SPD 
together at the Green-Red Coalition, who actually paved the path to what we have now. And um, they would just go on like this. And uh, when I met Tom Königs the other day, the head of the, or now former head of the Human Rights Committee of the um, Parliament, a member of the Green Party, he greeted me with the words, are we missing the FDP already? And, you know, if you look at the coalition treaty, I'm not a fan of the FDP, but, you know, they are dearly missed. Civil rights people or people who have at least a little bit left of a civil rights um, conscious, they are gone. Can we just fill in for the guests, uh, maybe from afar in the room, that the SPD is the German Labour Party that has just been elected into government and will probably be part of the Grand Coalition, and the FDP is the German Liberal Party that, for the first time since uh, this country exists, has been voted out of parliament and will now be an outer parliamentary oppositional, oppositional party. Which was a pro-business party and, uh, and didn't concentrate on some of their roots as a civil rights party, which it was once, and that's why probably they also lost, rightly so. Uh, Herr Ströberle, would you like to respond to any of that? Since it included some statements about the Green Party, I'm not sure if you feel comfortable with that. So. <laughs> um, es ist keine Frage, uh, dass uh, die FDP uh, in der Zeit, als sie jetzt uh, vier Jahre mitregiert hat, ein Verdienst hat. Sie hat verhindert, dass in Deutschland die Vorratsdatenspeicherung eingeführt worden ist, bis heute. Und die neue Regierung hat in ihren Koalitionsvereinbarungen drinstehen, dass die Vorratsdatenspeicherung nun exekutiert, also durchgeführt werden soll. Das heißt, es wird zunächst für sechs Monate sämtliche Daten, Telekommunikationsdaten werden gespeichert. Das können wir auch nicht verhindern mit unseren 8 Prozent im Deutschen Bundestag. Wir können nur versuchen, das immer wieder zum Problem zu machen und auch im Parlament, aber auch nach außen deutlich zu machen, zum Beispiel in einem parlamentarischen Untersuchungsausschuss, was damit angerichtet wird. So, um, if you want to credit the Liberal Party that's just been voted out of government with one thing, then from Mr. Strober's point of view, it can be the fact that they prohibited the data retention law, which has been passed on at EU-wide level, from uh, being implemented in Germany. So the Minister of Justice was from the Liberal Party and stood against that. Now that we're going to have this grand coalition, um, the data retention will be part of that deal. It's, uh, it's going to come up. Part of uh, the plan is to retain data for six months, that's including all the telecommunication data. And unfortunately, 8% uh, Green parties in the oppositional part in Parliament will not be able to prohibit that. They can just speak out against it and find uh, ways within Parliament to um, yeah, basically keep on people's toes, like creating parliamentary uh, gremia that will uh, monitor the implementation of the data retention here in Germany. Und wir können versuchen, mit der Zivilgesellschaft, wie das schon mal gemacht worden ist, beim höchsten Gericht, beim Bundesverfassungsgericht, äh, diese Regelung wieder anzugreifen. Alle, yes. Yes, <laughs> good reason for applause, because of course they will attempt in cooperation with civil society to, um, f uh, yeah, to basically f um, sue in the national uh, German courts against this data retention law. And we have been successful in doing that previously. So there's, there was a very big uh, net political win a couple of years ago when uh, the courts decided that, that data retention in Germany is against our constitution and decided not to implement those laws. And we hope to be able to do that again. So, but again, it's interesting to hear that essentially from a parliamentarian that there's not a lot they can do to control the intelligence services and that they're dependent on going to the constitutional courts, going to journalists and going to civil society to be even able to have the, the toothless tiger, as you mentioned it, able to bite. We have lots of people in the audience and I'd like to open it up for questions. Anybody over here, please? Do you want to get a microphone quickly and then? Yeah. My mic? Uh, so, so well, my name is Hauke, and I'm uh, with the German section of Reporters Without Borders. Um, and I found very interesting what you said uh, about uh, like a coalition maybe uh, between civil society and journalists. And I see, see your point, uh, Judith. So um, many of us are journalists, but we are also an NGO. And uh, you always have to, to keep in mind uh, the line 
um, bet between uh, these two functions, really. Um, but what I think will be crucial in the, in the next years uh, will be freedom of information laws and, uh, and that journalists as well as civil society uh, try to sue if they, they don't get the information and that this is a process that is quite, quite difficult. Uh, is there a question linked to that statement or is it just a statement? <laughs> well, maybe it's, it's more than a statement. So just uh, that, that we need to make sure that to hold people into account by, by focusing on yeah, freedom of information laws uh, quite a lot. Thank you. I believe there's a question over here. Um, <clears throat> it strikes me that the uh, simplest uh, way to uh, take on the, 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 the pro-surveillance lobby, as it were, um, is, is to kind of uh, take the argument through to its logical conclusion, which is that if, uh, which is that, you know, we're, we're advocating, uh, saying we're willing to accept a little slightly higher risk of being blown up uh, in exchange for uh, essential civil liberties. Do you think that there are politicians today who are willing to take, make such, I mean, it, it sounds like an incredibly radical statement to make. It's only the, the Benjamin Franklin, you know, thing about those who are willing to give up a bit of liberty for security deserve neither. Um, it's the same thing. But do, are there politicians today who are willing to say that? And uh, for the journalists on the panel um, and the ex-journalists, would the politicians be crucified for saying that? Fantastic question. Would you, any of you like to respond? I can say that we are going to watch it. <laughs> we'll see. And, um, but uh, for us, for example, during this, uh, from beginning in June, um, it was very important, not just commenting, but just showing like the re reaction of the politicians and what they are saying. One day we published an article that was just quotes quotes of Friedrich, quotes of Merkel, quotes of Westerwelle, all the politicians and nothing else. And just, um, and also we had Keith Alexander, whatever, like, but all the quotes just put together. So because the reader can um, judge himself and see what's happening. And because um, unfortunately or fortunately, the, one of the first quotes was um, after the revelation of uh, PRISM, of the program. Um, some journalists caught uh, Hans-Peter Friedrich, our federal minister of the interior, and uh, asked him on that, and this was when he said, yeah, um, we don't know what's going on there. Um, this is uh, anti-American and naive to uh, be against it. And nobody asked him for it, but right in the very next sentence, he started to talk about, um, I don't know, the word Fluggastdatenspeicher, uh, flight passenger uh, data preservation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, and uh, because he said we want to know who's inside and outside, we want to work closer together and we want to, what he actually said with this is uh, we want to uh, do more surveillance. And he just said it without any journalist asking for that, it was just, uh, or, I, or we didn't see it, but it was just he started with it. And so I think it's sometimes just important to show uh, what they are saying and for the people it's very important to listen to what uh, the politicians are saying and then... Uh, judge and vote. Yeah. I mean, um, now we will face the grand coalition and um, actually practically non-existing opposition in parliament. Um, they actually will just go ahead and do what they want, I'm, I'm very sure. For example, something that sounds quite harmless is the introduction of a toll system. You know, have to, foreigners have to, will have to pay when they use our motorways. You know, maybe that's good for some bucks in the box, but um, the, the real reason, and this is what our our Minister of Interior, <laughs> um, who sadly can't be here right now, revealed <laughs> without any embarrassment, he said, well, it's nice and handy because we can control who's going from X to Y, who's going from Berlin to Munich, who's using our motorways. Um, so, even under security aspects, that's completely idiotic because if I would be a terrorist, I would just take the other streets, you know, <laughs> or rent a car. So, uh, it's just surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. We do it because we can. Ja, zunächst ein Satz zu dem Informationsfreiheitsgesetz, also Freedom of Information Act. 
wir haben äh, unter der rot-grünen Regierung ein solches Gesetz eingeführt in Deutschland, äh, nur betrifft das leider nicht die Geheimdienste, die Nachrichtendienste. Das heißt, es gibt grundsätzlich ein Recht äh, vom Staat, Informationen zu bekommen, aber nicht in diesem Bereich. Das ist damals nicht gelungen. Da war eine Sperre. Äh, jetzt zu dem Frage Verhältnis Sicherheit und Bürgerrechte. Es wird ja immer wieder behauptet, äh, diese Überwachung der ganzen Bevölkerung oder der großer Bevölkerungsteile, millionenfach, milliardenfach Handydaten äh, aufzunehmen äh, und zu speichern, das sei erforderlich für den Kampf gegen den internationalen islamistischen Terrorismus. Ich habe dazu keine Bestätigung. Ich weiß nur, dass der Innenminister, der ja schon erwähnt worden ist, er zunächst erklärt hat, als er aus den USA kam, er hätte fünf Beispiele, wo ein Anschlag in Deutschland verhindert worden sei durch solche Daten. Ähm, wir haben ihn gefragt, welche Beispiele das sind. Äh, da wusste er nur eins. Ähm, dann hat er später erklärt, ja, es seien nicht fünf Anschläge gewesen, sondern es seien fünf Hinweise auf einen Anschlag gewesen und äh, ich habe dann beantragt, die Akten äh, einzusehen, aus denen sich das ergibt. Das ist beschlossen worden, dass ich die Akten oder wir die Akten einsehen dürfen. Bis heute warte ich darauf, dass ich überhaupt eine Akte zu Gesicht bekomme. Ähm, das heißt, äh, ich bezweifle, dass für den Kampf gegen den internationalen Terrorismus, das erforderlich ist. Und ich will dann gleich dazu noch ein weiteren Satz. Okay, aber danke. Okay, one sentence on the freedom of information, a point that was made. There is a freedom of information law in Germany, however, it is limited and of course it exempts secret service issues. Um, those are not included in the range of what the freedom of information law covers here. Um, and the point that was made, of course, there's this, this rhetoric that we need all this uh, mass surveillance to stop international Islamic terrorism. And uh, Mr. Strobler believes that there is no evidence that there is actually, um, yeah, that, that that is actually the reason why we need the surveillance and it is actually stopping terrorism from happening. So, of course, you think most of you know that when Mr. Friedrich, uh, Minister of the Interior, returned from his uh, friendly trip to the US, he came back saying, oh, but I have five examples of how um, intelligence has stopped um, terrorist attacks from happening in Germany. We have big fear of politics here. We need to be scared of terrorists all the time in Germany, of course, as well, even though we've not been attacked here. Um, and when Mr. Strobler asked, well, can you tell me what they are, he was only able to cite one. I corrected himself saying, well, actually, they weren't five separate cases. They were five hints on this one presumed attack that could have possibly happened. Um, and so, um, yeah, m Mr. Schroeder seriously doubts that this rhetoric, which is always used, is, is really what is driving all this um, crave for increased surveillance and has requested insight into these files and has been promised that this was happened, but he's still waiting to see a single file today. Und spätestens seit feststeht, dass das Handy der Kanzlerin abgehört worden ist, ist dieses Argument, es ginge immer um den Kampf gegen den internationalen Terrorismus eigentlich widerlegt. Weil ich kann mir nicht vorstellen, dass im Handy der Kanzlerin die Terroristen anrufen oder dass, dass sie Mails schickt äh, an Terroristen. Äh, das heißt, die Überwachung ihres Handys kann damit nicht gerechtfertigt sein. Und der Chef der NSA, Herr General Alexander, äh, hat behauptet, Sie würden sich in Deutschland immer, die NSA, an Gesetz und Recht handel, äh, halten. Ich kenne kein Gesetz in Deutschland, das das Abhören des Handys der Kanzlerin rechtfertigt. Ich kenne nur Gesetze, die hohe Freiheitsstrafen verhängen für solche Spionageakte. Okay, so... Um Mr. Schroeder argued that, uh, you know, later since the whole Merkel phone, since it was disclosed that NSA has been tapping Merkel's phone for the past decade or so, that whole argument of 
that we you know, need to survey people because they might be terrorists should have gone out the window because he seriously doubts that Ms. Merkel has you know, all these Islamic terrorists calling her all the time on her mobile phone or she's writing emails to them via her phone. And so that can hardly be the case. And in fact, he knows no laws that would cover that sort of activity or excuse that sort of activity from taking place here. It's rather the contrary that there are laws that um, would send people to jail for a really long time tapping somebody's phone the way that this has been done. I'm, I'm amazed in this debate how everybody trusts Mrs. Merkel not to be calling the wrong people. Maybe she's doing things that we don't know about. <laughs> Please, we have a question over here. Sorry. And I just say one, two, three, four, five. Six. Six. Seven, eight. Maybe we can take three or four questions at a time, I'm otherwise we'll you never get, please. That's okay, so we, we take three, three questions, questions. And then get three answers. And then we get three answers. I'd like to come back to the um, civil society question. Uh, we see multinationals merging, so they're less companies, they're more powerful. I see everyday new civil society organizations. I've never seen a merger of two civil society organizations. And thirdly, we see that media is kind of going down. So my question is, do civil society organizations have to take over a publication platform or buy a newspaper and create their own outlet? Hi there. My name is Carl von Links from the You Broke the Internet Initiative. Um, what about a legislation that would uh, make, let's say, from 2015, you can no longer buy cell phones or computers that do not have a protection of communication and mean, by means of encryption or social graph protection built into the law that you cannot sell phones that do not do this by default. So cryptographic protection of privacy by law. What hinders us from bringing this forward? Fantastic, thank you. We have another question right at the back. One second, even further back as well. Okay, you first, please. Hi, uh, just, it's rather a short question. Go for it, it's okay. Okay. Um, the to the parliamentarian uh, on, the, on the panel, uh, my question is, how would secret service oversight in principle work? Because the very feature of a secret service is that it's secret. So how, because I, I hear a lot that we have an oversight problem and all this, but I don't even understand how this could work in print. I mean, it has never worked, but how should it work in principle in, in fairy tale world? <laughs> we have questions. About I'm various not different aspects. If I got the first question right, was the question if there should be a platform by organizations, or was the question to buy a newspaper because the newspaper don't earn I enough money? I think it money? was the question about the fragmentation of civil society versus sort of large global conglomerates, and there's so many tiny civil society organizations rather than sort of large platforms where they can become active. Um, so isn't this a weakness? You can answer to that question better, but I wanted to say something about Please. the encryption and allowing because I think. Uh, this is uh, one expectation I really have on the politicians that um, at least, because I see this is really hard to stop. Global surveillance is a global problem and um, I'm totally sticking to what Snowden said, yeah, it needs a global solution and it's like really hard to protect uh, your own citizens. And we all heard the discussions about the uh, Schlandnetz, which would be like a German internet, which is without the inter actually. And uh, just having some net works and it's really hard. But I think at least I would um, hope for awareness and um, that our politi politicians allow our citizens to encrypt their mails, which is totally uh, allowed right now, but maybe it might be prohibited. And so I think this is like really important to let them choose to protect their privacy if they can do it themselves. So I think this is a very important point. Wenzel, would you like to respond as well? And then Ms. Christian. Yeah, I want to um, answer Christian's question. Um, well, if I would have an answer. <laughs> Uh, which I don't because, uh, but it is a problem which we are actually internally discussing and I've just come back from a retreat where we um, were looking into where are we in five years with our media work and how we could, for example, also be a platform for other NGOs to open up Human Rights Watch's website for other NGOs, become a loudspeaker and amplifier maybe and uh, what it would mean, we would not be a competition to the traditional media, but we would be probably something additional, a an, an platform where you can get information which is also much more user-friendly than now. We, uh, originally, we, are, um, we come from a 
we were, our founders were publishers, so we used to write long reports, 80, 150 pages. Nobody really reads them, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's there also for proof, and you can look up things in there. But um, also to how do we make our pressers more user-friendly, not only for journalists, but also for people who come to our website. And since we started to um, implement much more multimedia films and and, and photos and, and stuff like this and, and shorten it a bit and make it more sexy for users, um, we have many more visitors on our website. I mean, really, it, it, it exploded. And I think this is where NGOs have to go. They have to be smarter as information outlets and become media in their own means. Would you like to respond to the question of the secret services being controllable at all? Uh, um. Also ich bin kein Spezialist äh, in äh, Verschlüsselung äh, von äh, Telekommunikation. Aber äh, wir alle haben ja gelesen, äh, dass es in den USA äh, Firmen gibt, oder man muss fast sagen gab, äh, die Verschlüsselungssysteme haben, äh, die offenbar auch von Snowden erfolgreich benutzt worden sind. Äh, und dass diesen Firmen verboten worden ist, weiter solche Systeme, Verschlüsselungssysteme zu verkaufen. Ich glaube, da gibt es eigentlich nur eine Reaktion. Ich habe gesagt, wir müssen diesen Firmen anbieten, dass sie in Europa, in Deutschland produzieren können. Und ich habe sie herzlich eingeladen, doch ihre Niederlassung nach Kreuzberg zu wollen. Okay, so uh, this is not the answer to the question on the secret services, but the answer to the question on cryptography. Mr. Truel said that, uh, to his knowledge, there are a number of US-based companies that were um, offering encryption tools and services have now been forbidden to sell such systems in the US, and he has invited all of them to come and uh, move to Germany, specifically to Kreuzberg, and come and produce from there. So I hope you're listening on the web stream. You're all very welcome. If you have another question right at the back yeah. over here. Three. Nein, so, uh, there was one, one, was, wir, was wir ganz dringend brauchen uh, in Deutschland, uh, das gibt es ja in den USA, wenn auch sehr unzulänglich. Und wir haben das in Deutschland auch schon im Bundestag beantragt, ein Whistleblower-Gesetz. Uh, wir müssen einen Schutz von Whistleblowern uh, gesetzlich garantieren können. Um, Gerade die Ereignisse, die uns jetzt in den letzten Monaten intensiv beschäftigen, zeigen, wie notwendig das ist und vor allen Dingen auch, wie weitgehend das sein muss. Weil das Gesetz, was wir noch im letzten Sommer vorgelegt haben im Deutschen Bundestag, wäre unzulänglich. Das heißt, wir müssen da einen gesetzlichen Schutz einführen. Das ist nichts Neues, das gibt es in den USA. Nur in den USA gilt das eben auch nur immer zum Schutz von US-Bürgern. So wie in Deutschland die Gesetze auch nur immer gelten zum Schutz von deutschen Bürgern. Und da muss man anfangen, international zu denken, europäisch und international, um Whistleblower international zu schützen. Um, so, um, to the last point, <laughs> Mr. Stroh was saying that what we need is we need a law that protects uh, the security of whistleblowers. And we need this law not just on a, focusing like on this from a national perspective, but international perspective. The Green Party brought forth such a law in the summer uh, prior to all these revelations, um, which would have not been, would have not been sufficient. Uh, in the situation now. Of course, there's a US law uh, for the whistleblowers as well, but that also just um, uh, protects the rights of US citizens. What we need here is a law that does not just protect the rights of German citizens who are whistleblowers, but um, everyone. Chancellor, very briefly, and then we have a Yeah, very, very briefly. I just want to react to what Mr. Schrubel said about inviting the uh, companies to Europe and Germany. I would be very worried. I think that it wouldn't be any better. Um, I'm fine with Kreuzberg. If you would found a new republic of Kreuzberg, then <laughs> probably it would work. And for the privacy by law, I think um, that's a great idea. And we need to also engage with the companies like Google and Yahoo and so um, to um, press them. And also they're actually shaking for f of fear because they are afraid of losing business. So I know you're shaking your head, but... <laughs> we have more questions at the back. 
So uh, my question would be, it was before you said, like the right one, um, about the definition power of the journalists, like how, what to bring into the news and what not. So uh, in Germany we have like four agencies which are like um, every half a year uh, making these um, Umfragen. What is Umf Surveys. Surveys. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what kind of, what the people want to read, what they are interested in, kind of, um, and they are asking 10,000 or 20,000 people, I guess, um, and these 20,000 people, uh, we say, make the opinion for whole Germany. So this is like a system thing where to, where to go in, kind of, because, like, yeah. And then another thing, what, um, this guy Becker said yesterday that all the media is just like um, putting all the attention just to a few topics. So you have just the overview of a few topics and um, but not go deep into it and have like this this categorized and um, overall meaning for all kind of and how to uh, really change that so that the system of the media is not about getting people's attention on. Um, uh, Sinnlosen Zeug. <laughs> Useless stuff. <laughs> Useless stuff, thank you. Uh, but to uh, bring them on the issues, what we're discussing right now, what is really important and what they should stand for, because this is not what the media transports kind of, or is in any way interested in, I would say. We have another question over here. <coughs> yep. um, what uh, especially technologists are concerned is not like really surveillance uh, as a main uh, topic, it's more about uh, the insecurity by design that the secret services really break encryption, that they break trust on, on all levels and they really break technology, which means that they make our um, uh, technological world much, much unsafer um, because they really plant backdoors and stuff like that, which can also be used by like uh, organized crime or like um, hostile secret services. So my question to um, Mr. Schröbele is, um, was this in, uh, a topic in the, in, the, in the parliamentarian control group um, that uh, the secret services are um, pushing insecurities into the society? I mean like, that they really break, uh, that they really like, yeah, like, like break technology for the means of doing whatever they want. There's another question right behind you. Uh, it's not connected, but should I just wait for the answer? Please, ask your question. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know much about Germany. I've just parachuted into Berlin today, so it's a fascinating discussion to have, to listen to this, uh, the three pillars of democracy sitting here. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I was just uh, thinking that, you know, I feel that both politicians and journalists respond a lot to the citizen, politicians uh, from voters and journalists to the readership. Uh, and you know, we see that print journalism is going down and politicians despite uh, uh, have other, other preferences. Uh, but uh, the overall you feel that the idea of civil society is becoming more consumer society than political society. And uh, it's almost like you've started taking democracy for granted. Maybe. Uh, in Germany uh, or other parts of the world where we had democracy for the last 50, 60 years or maybe longer, uh, start taking for granted what it means. And that you don't, the, the problems could be much deeper. Uh, you can have, for example, a whistleblower's law uh, where you protect the rights of the whistleblower but still have no data protection laws. Like in, I give example in India, we are coming up with, the, with a new whistleblower's law but there's no protection of data and the new uh, universal identification numbers. There's no data protection law. Do you have a specific question so based on the, that? I'm, I'm saying the roots of this could be much deeper than technological fixes. We're really confronting a kind of social society which is really taking things for granted. I can hear what you're saying. I just can't hear a question in it. That's the only reason I'm asking. Well, it's just a, I'm it's a statement. Fair enough. That's I'm, just, I'm just thinking that whether any technology fixes of uh, encryption, anything, because anything you can encrypt, you can you can work a fix around that as well. Whether you need to do something, NGOs need to do something else. It's a great question. Um, would you like to respond? I wanted to respond. I wanted to uh, respond to the selection question, if I can. I'm not really sure because that's a big topic that we can discuss <laughs> later, maybe again. But um, I know that there are a lot of people who don't like the selection or think the media are too powerful or. Um, uh, 
choosing the wrong topics, uh, whatever. Um, but um, I think, first of all, it, uh, as you all know, there are platforms who are publishing without like having some media magazine or anything in behind. But also, there are like a lot of uh, huge documents, piles of documents, and a lot of people just don't read it. So that they call again and say, ah, can you have a look at these files, please? Because uh, can you kind of read them for the reader? Because they are pretty long, what you said about like 180 pages. Nobody will read that except for he's very, very, or he, he or she is very, very interested in this topic. And so we're trying to make it um, maybe shorter, maybe easier. And I see the point that sometimes people say, yeah, too easy, too short, too flat. Um, but uh, to get even more people to be interested. And um, I'll give you an example for the selection, because always the people think, yeah, then the selection is we are all only talking about whatever Dieter Bohlen and uh, not about the really uh, serious stuff. And this is not true because, for example, especially for and uh, the, um, data retention, um, after this uh, coalition contract came out and um, we started to publish um, three, four articles in a row just saying, hey, for we talked about that already and the people don't want to read it, we know it, and they, most of the people don't read it just very because I'm working online, I can see all the clicks and only few people read it, but we still keep on publishing topics which are uh, a selection, although we know that the people are not really interested in them because we think they are important and we uh, are trying to reach at least one more or one more and maybe one day they are a lot. Okay. Yeah, I would like to answer, uh, hopefully answer your question, um, whether we need uh, fixes in our civil society or our law and our culture. Um, I mean, look, um, if it comes, when it comes to freedom of expression, freedom of press and um, freedom of opinion, then our laws or the last changes and reforms of our laws date back to the 80s and 90s. That was before the internet. Now we have the internet and the problem starts. There's nothing that actually um, is in respect to the internet. So we need new fixes there to actually um, strengthen our values so that th uh, the internet doesn't become the technology we have now, which is uncontrolled in a democratic sense, I mean. <laughs> Any last responses on this side? Ja, das, <coughs> das kann ich bestätigen. Ich habe an den Gesetzen in den 90er Jahren mitgewirkt. <coughs> Und wir haben natürlich nicht im Traum dran gedacht, was heute möglich ist, rein technisch. Und wir haben auch nicht im Traum daran gedacht, dass die Telekommunikation, die ich hier innerhalb Berlins betreibe, mit einer anderen Person, einer anderen Stelle, dass die über die USA geht und gefährdet ist, auf dem Wege dazwischen gespeichert, kopiert und gespeichert zu werden. Das heißt, das ist eine solche rasche Entwicklung, dass wir als Gesetzgeber überhaupt nicht nachgekommen sind und äh, da ist ganz dringend Arbeit angesagt unter fachkundiger Leitung. Ich bin schon zu alt äh, und die meisten sind zu alt im Deutschen Bundestag, aber dafür gibt es ja junge, <lacht> dafür gibt's junge Mitarbeiter in Staffs, die äh, das dann so äh, aufschreiben können und so formulieren können, äh, dass wir dann so ein Gesetz machen. Aber das ist ganz, ganz dringend erforderlich, weil es gibt riesige Lücken da. Und zu der anderen Frage. So, uh, yes, um, Mr. Strobe is working back on telecommunication regulations issues uh, in the 90s. And back then, there was just no vision of what the world is like today. People did not envision that all our data would flow by, through the USA to come back to us here. And, and how, to, how to service that with the laws that we have uh, was just, that, yeah, that wasn't a concept back then. So he would agree, like, our legislation is extremely behind and there's so much catching up to do. Now, Mr. Strobe said he's, you know, he's uh, too old, as are most people in Parliament, to have full technical understanding. Uh, but with the help of younger uh, colleagues and advisors, uh, he hopes that that will be possible. And legislation must and has to catch up in the near future. Nur mal als Beispiel, als rauskam, dass es, dass es ein Trojaner gibt und was ein Trojaner ist, musste ich auch erst schwierig lernen. Äh, wir haben das gar nicht geglaubt, dass das möglich ist geschweige denn, dass wir eine gesetzliche Regelung haben, um das äh, zu kontrollieren oder einzudämmen. So, just as an example, what 
when it first came out, you know, that there, like Mr. Shaw didn't know there was such a thing as a Trojan until Trojans, you know, happened here. And we have such things as state Trojans in Germany and, and that something like that must be addressed and something like that has to be, uh, yes, uh, dealt with on a legislative level as well. Und zu Ihrer Frage, äh, was im parlamentarischen Kontrollgremium besprochen worden ist, etwa äh, über äh, Schädigung von Technik durch die Geheimdienste, da muss ich Ihnen leider als erstes sagen, ich darf Ihnen überhaupt nicht verraten, was im parlamentarischen Kontrollgremium besprochen wird. Ähm, ich ich, ich mache mich strafbar, wenn ich das tue. Und das ist einer der Fehler unserer Konstruktion des parlamentarischen Kontrollgremiums dass wir über alles, was da gesprochen äh, wird, nichts nach außen geben dürfen. Wir müssen versuchen, das zu durchbrechen, aber ich kann Ihnen sagen, diese Problematik, die Sie jetzt angesprochen haben, war mir bisher nicht bekannt. Das ist das Deutsche mal. So, um, unfortunately, Mr. Schrivel cannot really answer the question, even if he did have an answer that Fukukami raised on as to how far the uh, German Secret Service has been actively attacking uh, encryption technologies, um, because he's not allowed to disclose any of the information discussed in this parliamentary control gremium. And that is one of the things that is fundamentally wrong with the structures that we have today, is that even if he is told these things as a parliamentarian in this control gremium, he's not able to share them with the general public, even if he thinks that that, that should be done. Vor zehn Jahren durfte ich noch nicht mal sagen, wann ich eine Sitzung des Parlamentarischen Kontrollgremiums habe und wo. Ich musste in meinem Büro, wo ich mich dann abgemeldet habe, ich bin die nächsten zwei, drei Stunden nicht da, musste immer sagen, ich gehe zum Rumpelstieß hier. <lacht> Stop, just cut it short. Okay, so 10 years ago, it, you know, it's, it was maybe this is a bright, hopeful look into the future that things can get better. It's because 10 years ago, Mr. Tribble wasn't even allowed to say when he was going to go to a meeting of this parliamentary control agreement and had to put something cryptic like visiting, I'd say, Mother Goose instead of Grundverstehen in, uh, in his calendar to like give some vague idea that he might be out of the office for at least two hours, but not saying where he was actually going. We have one last question at the back and then we're. Come close, please. So uh, I had a, a statement first, which is that I, I've heard a lot about America here, and I wanted to say that there are at least two Americas. And the first America is the one that we see all the time with Obama, which is probably why Merkel's phone was tapped, something related to that. And, and the other is the Americans that are basically not able to be free and that are being oppressed. And those, that second group, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Strobler, for going and meeting with Snowden and for supporting his cause, because he supports the rest of us. And, and the second question is, I wonder if it's possible, to, to follow up on Carlos's question, if it's possible that the Green Party, or just in general, any German politicians, will support end-to-end -to -end encryption where the cryptographic key is only in the hands of the user and that we will give up on wiretapping with the understanding that the game is rigged. That is, whenever you choose to spy on Germans, even through a lawful process, that the NSA wins every time. It's designed against you. And I wonder if there is the political will to recognize that the secret secure phone that Merkel has and that you have, that that could be something that all of us should be able to have affordably to protect ourselves, both here and abroad. Nur noch mal zu dem Besuch bei Edward Snowden. Für mich ist, Sie haben glaube ich gesagt, Sie sind US-Citizen. Ne? Für mich ist ganz wichtig auch die Botschaft von ihm, das hat er mir nicht ausdrücklich gesagt, sondern das entnehme ich dem Gespräch, dass Edward Snowden, ich sage das ungern, weil ich wenig von Patriotismus halte, aber Edward Snowden ist ein US-amerikanischer Patriot, wie er im Buche steht. Er riskiert unendlich viel für seine ganze Existenz, möglicherweise für sein Leben, im Interesse der Aufdeckung, der Fehlentwicklung der NSA in den USA, der Gesetzesbrüche und wie er auch immer sagt, der Crimes in den USA, dass dann auch die übrige Welt davon profitiert, weil sie 
äh, weil seine Aufdeckung auch die übrige Welt, das ist, äh, kommt danach. Er hat immer wieder betont, das Wichtigste ist, diese Tätigkeit, diese gesetzwidrige Tätigkeit der NSA in den USA zu beenden und deshalb möchte er auch am liebsten vor dem US-Kongress, vor einem dortigen Ausschuss eine Aussage machen. Das will mir jetzt über diesen Besuch, habe ich ja schon viel erzählt, will ich sagen, aber das ist mir sehr wichtig, um das gerade gegenüber äh, US-Citizen deutlich zu machen. So, this is a comment on the visit, um, on visiting Edward Snowden. Um, and this is a very strong message that Mr. Schröbler took away from this encounter. Mr. Schröbler says he would never consider himself a patriot, but Edward Snowden certainly is. Um, he's risking his own existence and even his own life because he believes that the NSA, that the NSA is destroying the concept of freedom in, in the US that he believes in and it would be his greatest wish to return home and speak in front of Congress and be able to explain that he is a patriotic citizen and is doing this for and not against his country. Are there any further responses? If not, I'd like to say thank you very much for three wonderful pillars of democracy, as they were called in the audience, <laughs> for being here. And